Hello everyone. Let me welcome you to yet another session of the NPTEL course, The History of English Language and Literature. Today's lecture is titled The Age of Wordsworth and we also know that this is part of the extended age of romanticism that we began looking at in the previous session. In the previous session, we also noted that there were multiple influences that led to this emergence of romanticism, which also began to manifest itself from the end of the 18th century onwards. In that sense, the 18th century also gets figured and uh, represented as the age of transition. If we try to recall the context and conditions that made possible the emergence of romanticism, the French Revolution is of supreme importance. We also notice that the Romantic age gets designated as the age of revolutions and some of the details of this we have already taken a look at in the previous session. Apart from this, there were also other major socio-political events which were influencing this uh, foundational uh, period of Romanticism. We notice that England was witnessing a rapid change in the form of industrialization as well. So, we find the economy and the general temperament of the nation changing itself from that of an agricultural nation to that of an industrial nation. And this also began to uh, reflect and manifest itself in uh, other multiple ways within the economy. We also find the dominance of uh, the laws of a free market and this also uh, heavily influences the ways in which the economy is shaped and also the uh, ways in which the commercial and the trade relationships within the nation get uh, redefined. Industrial revolution was a major event that also began to shape the literature of the period especially from the late 19th century onwards and uh, as the forerunner of this uh, uh, impending change we find a very significant shift in the balance of power. Accordingly, we notice that there is a transfer of power from the land holding aristocracy to the large scale employers of modern industrial communities. This emergence of the modern industrial communities was not uh, free from the uh, other kinds of socio cultural repercussions and this also forms the basis and the uh, major theme of most of the works of the late 19th century. The other major uh, repercussion or the co consequence was the transition from rural farm labourers to urban industrial labourers. So, we also find that apart from this uh, uh, major fundamental transition from being uh, the centre of a rural economy towards the centre of an urban economy. Beyond that, there is a way in which it also affects the lifestyle of the people and also there is a way in which industries begin to dominate rather than the, uh, the rustic agricultural uh, setting. Continuing to look at the major context and conditions, we also uh, take a look at the major milestones in the beginning of the uh, Romantic age. The most important event being the French Revolution of the 1789 and the same year also witnessed the publication of William Blake's Songs of Innocence. This work also uh, is one of the foundational works of the Romantic era. 1792 is a year that also uh, is of supreme political imp uh, importance. Uh, we find a lot of restrictions being imposed on the freedom of press but on the other hand there are also a lot of positive things happening. Uh, such as the publication of Mary Wollstonecraft's Vindication of the Rights of Women. And this is a work that we also took a look at in detail in uh, one of the previous sessions as it is also considered as uh, an extended uh, work uh, from the age of uh, Johnson. The, the year 1798 was also important in colonial history. It, uh, it, it was the year in which the first major resistance to East India Company was faced from the Indian subcontinent and this was also the year in which uh, uh, Tipu Sultan uh, uh, got uh, killed and this incidentally was also the year which inaugurated the moment of romanticism uh, within British history with the publication of lyrical ballads. The other major intellectual influences apart from the French Revolution could be, uh, could be seen in the many works that followed uh, the French Revolution and also in and around the time of this age of revolution. Uh, French Revolution as we have noted uh, it was a source of hope not just for Britain but also for the rest of the Europe. It was the symbol of freedom, democracy and equality. This was also the event which triggered the publication of many events which celebrated as well as opposed these revolutionary uh, tendencies uh, within modern uh, governmental systems. In 1790, Edmund Burke wrote Reflections on the Revolution in France. This was a response to the French Revolution, but it was not a, a work which really celebrated the qualities of the revolution, but it was a work which uh, lamented and also which, uh, which uh, despised the, the horrors which uh, accompanied this revolution. On the other hand, there was also works such as Thomas Paine's uh, The Rights of Man published in 1791-92. 
This incidentally became a cult text not just in Britain but across Europe. This work was d secretly distributed among radicals within Britain and it was also a huge source of inspiration as well as a huge source of uh, radical and evolutionary ideas in uh, British history. And accordingly, we also find that Payne was under uh, a lot of uh, supervision. He also had to uh, flee to France in order to escape being indicted for treason. So, Payne's influence was uh, felt not just in the 18th century, but it went on to uh, the 19th century as well in shaping and reshaping the, uh, uh, the, uh, the radical ideals which Britain was to uphold for a long time. Joseph Priestley was another important figure in this leak. His uh, letters to Edmund Burke in favour of uh, the reform uh, movements within Britain, it was much celebrated during that time. It also became a foundational text of uh, uh, political understanding at a later time. William Godwin's uh, publication Political Justice in 1793 was of supreme importance. It also introduced the notion of enlightened self-interest to the British citizens for the first time. It also became an influential and foundational philosophical text for the rest of Europe. In 1776, Jeremy Bentham's Fragment of Government was uh, published, but however, we find a lasting influence of this only in the uh, Romantic uh, period because it was the time when the uh, British uh, uh, people in general uh, were more prepared to, uh, to accept uh, the revolutionary theses which were uh, proposed by Jeremy Bentham. Bentham also went on to become an influence not just in Britain but also across uh, the various nations of Europe. If we come to look at the literature of the Romantic period which also is the focus of our lecture, we notice that this period was dominated by four major genres namely poetry, non-fiction, fiction and drama. Poetry incidentally is the most representative genre of this period and we also find Romantic age majorly being connected with the British uh, poetry of these times. Uh, there was also a significant production in terms of uh, non-fiction such as the essays of Lamb and Hazlitt which were hugely popular not just during those times but also in the later times. And in terms of fiction, this was the period which began to witness a mature kind of writing especially with the writings of Jane Austen and Walter Scott which were not just literary artifacts but were also hugely popular and read across Europe. Drama was of uh, uh, not much significance in the romantic period but nevertheless we do notice that there were a few productions which ensured that, they, that the genre had not completely gone out of uh, fashion. The focus of the first part of our uh, discussions on the Romantic age is obviously on poetry and Romantic poets they continue to be the most anthologized and the studied poets in English literature. They are also considered as the most famous and the most read and the most uh, quoted ones uh, in, in among all kinds of literature. Wordsworth and Coleridge they are considered as the founding figures of Romanticism. At this point it is also useful to remember that Blake was also one of the earliest influences but however for uh, the purposes of convenience and also for a uh, more systematic kind of understanding of Romanticism we shall be coming back to Blake only after our discussions on uh, Wordsworth and Coleridge. But however some historians uh, they uh, due to the chronological reasons they also find it quite uh, compelling to first talk about Blake and then move on to. Uh, Wordsworth and uh, Coleridge. Most of romantic poets they were quite different from their predecessors because they were not really inventing a new form or a new uh, subject matter or for that matter they were not even trying to uh, put forth new rules or new regulations or new kinds of rigidities for the uh, composition of poetry. On the other hand their focus was on merely responding out of experiences to events and the situations around them. So, in that sense there was a very definitive quality that uh, made them distinct from their predecessors as we noted in the earlier session at the end of the earlier session itself that imagination was the most important quality that the romantic uh, poets celebrated that also made it quite uh, uh, significant for them to rely on their own individual uh, capacities on, and, uh, on their own individual genius rather than any other external phenomena or an external set of rules that were to uh, regulate their composition or regulate their choice of themes or uh, the, uh, their form of writing. William Wordsworth is perhaps the most important representative figure of the Romantic uh, uh, age and he is also the best known poet uh, among from this age. He lived from 1770 till 1850 and he was uh, also you know uh, he was also quite uh, delighted to live and to be young during the period of the French Revolution as he himself has written. 
His early life was influenced by the countryside and its pleasures and virtues and that since from this point of time we also begin to see a set of writers who were not thoroughly born and brought up or bred in uh, uh, London but who were also uh, uh, quite significantly shaped by the countryside and also the, uh, also the rural uh, sectors. So, in that sense there is a way in which the poetry markedly becomes different from that of the town poetry of the Augustan period and also in all our discussions until this point of time we have noted that all of these writers they had some connection or the other during their growing up years with London and also that they all, always had to talk more about London than the countryside. But from Wordsworth's time onwards we find a radical shift in this approach towards the uh, rural and the urban. He was educated initially uh, at a college in Lancashire and, and then he, uh, he, he goes to Cambridge to complete his, edu his education. But what uh, entirely um, shaped his uh, poetry and also changed his vision of life was the two visits that he made to France in 1790 and in 1791 and 92. He was very young and uh, immensely influenced by the events which were happening in France during this time. If you remember this was also the peak time of the French revolution and also in that sense a perfect time for a young intellectual to visit France. In 1793 we find him composing two major poems an evening walk and descriptive sketches and uh, curiously uh, this was uh, these two works uh, were quite heavily reminiscent of Pope Goldsmith and uh, Crabbe and all of them Augustan writers and all of them uh, major proponents of the uh, intellectual kind of uh, poetry. But we do see that he, uh, Wordsworth transforms a lot from these earlier kinds of writings and er, uh, these earlier kinds of influences and he in fact eventually goes on to sh reshape the ways in which poetry has been understood or poetry has been received in literary history. It is said that uh, Wordsworth's uh, uh, turn to the writing poems it was quite dramatic because he was uh, uh, made financially independent by a legacy left by a friend and uh, he did not have to pursue any other kind of occupation to sustain himself and we find him, him devoting himself completely to the writing of poetry. In uh, 1796 he also begins a wonderful friendship with uh, Coleridge which was also to change his uh, poetic career in many different ways. In 1798 Coleridge and uh, Wordsworth together they publish lyrical ballads and epoch making text which was to revolutionize the uh, writing of not just poetry but of literature itself. In 1802 Wordsworth gets married to Mary Hutchinson but however his literary career did not take off for uh, many years during his young uh, years when he had written much of his poetry he failed to get adequate public attention and we also find that he was treated with a lot of contempt by most of the contemporary critics. But at a later point it is just now the irony of history that he also becomes identified as the most important literary figure of the romantic age and also significantly the proponent and the inaugurator of the romantic uh, uh, form of poetry. It is only by 1843 that he receives enough official and public recognition when he becomes the poet laureate after Robert Sade's death. When we talk about Wordsworth and his poetic career it is almost impossible not to talk about France and uh, the impact of the revolution on the shaping of the poetic genius of Wordsworth. The formative influences of uh, his visits to France is recorded very uh, recorded in detail in one of his earlier uh, poems The Prelude. The first visit happened in 1790 and this was a time when he was really delighted to find benevolence and blessedness spread like a fragrance everywhere. This incidentally was the initial stage of uh, the revolution and um, uh, Wordsworth was uh, quite uh, uh, taken in by all of the things which were happening in France and the kind of influence that this revolution had uh, all over Europe. He was sympathetic to the cause but uh, he was more like an onlooker at this point of time. He was not an active participant, he was just only an onlooker who was majorly delighted by these new turn of events. But the second visit which happens uh, uh, about a year later that was for a prolonged period he stayed in France for about 13 months and he also became an enthusiastic supporter of the revolution. And this period was more active in terms of his participation and in October 1792 it is said that he almost became an active uh, part of the revolution and he joins the uh, Girondist party as some of the later historians would put it. Fortunately for him he received a peremptory call from relatives in England and returned in time to escape the disaster which overwhelmed that party in the reign of terror. 
had he not come back the history of english literature and the history of the romantic poetry would have been totally different because uh, we all know what kind of unfortunate turn of events followed the reign of uh, terror in france in 1792 itself wordsworth returns to england he comes back to london and he is faced with a lot of uh, uh, he is faced with a lot of uh, mm, in 1792 wordsworth returns to england and he is quite surprised to know that the uh, the intellectual ambience in london is dominated by conservative opinion against the revolution and in uh, fact uh, during this time he also thinks it's uh, the onus is upon him to defend the revolution because he was a night witness because he was almost a part of it uh, in when he was in france and he even uh, writes an open letter of defense uh, to the bishop bishop of uh, landaf and also um, thereby he becomes an open supporter of the revolution during this time and the support was quite genuine as well but how were certain other events that followed it uh, began to shake the enthusiasm and the faith that wordsworth had on the success and the impact of the revolution initially it was the event uh, the uh, initially the event was uh, the war between france and england where he had to choose between his uh, nationalist loyalties and also his uh, uh, his um, uh, his enthusiasm with the revolution Uh, but the reign of re- but the reign of terror ensured that he had no sympathies left for the revolution anymore and his entire faith in this movement was thoroughly shaken in fact uh, wordsworth was not alone in being shaken by this uh, unfortunate turn of events that french revolution was to take there were many others who were quite disillusioned by the ways in which the revolution proved quite a failure by uh, by becoming a, a bloody a war of uh, bloody war for uh, the um, for the clamoring of power hudson talks about uh, the this transition that uh, wordsworth had to undergo in a very interesting way he notes it revived for a moment on the fall of robespierre only to be destroyed forever by the rise of napoleon and the events which followed so this reaction to this uh, uh, disappointment uh, with the revolution affected wordsworth in many ways and first of all it forced him to uh, break away from france forever this rupture with france was to affect his uh, uh, poetic genius and also his personality in multiple ways because if you remember as a young person he had visited france and he was the one who wrote that it was uh, uh, quite a heaven to be young during that time and uh, he uh, we do not find him going back to france or sympathizing with the french cause anymore and secondly this led to the repudiation of all the abstract principles behind the revolution which in the first place had uh, affected and influenced him in a major way and thirdly we find a complete recantation of all of wordsworth's youthful and progressive uh, ideas so in that sense we find this unfortunate turn of events of the revolution affecting the overall personality of wordsworth and also we find him moving back from the progressiveness that he uh, professed through his poetry and through his personality in the beginning so at a later point we'll also take a look at how many of the other supporters of the revolution and also the supporters and the the ones who were inspired by wordsworth were quite uh, led down by this kind of backtracking that uh, they thought wordsworth had done uh, but wordsworth did have his own kind of uh, uh, rationale for this uh, uh, backtracking he also felt that uh, the revolution had betrayed him in many ways though he had immense faith in the revolution so wordsworth transition from an adherent revolu- adherent of the revolution to an extreme conservative also marks his poetic career in a very distinctive way we find his uh, uh, poetry and his uh, subject matter and the treatment of the themes changing in uh, many different ways across his poetic career but nevertheless though he ceased to be a supporter of the revolution in an overt way the ideals which influenced him in the first place place it remained with him forever so much so that it was to shape the the uh the, the future of british poetry in a way that it was to stay forever and this influence found its supreme manifestation in the publication the lyrical ballads which uh, as we've already noted was an epoch making book in the uh, history of british literature this work opened a new chapter uh, in the history of english uh, poetry and it was also in contemporary terms could be considered as the punk moment in english poetry this was a work which uh, also marked the full development of both romanticism and naturalism the tendencies of which uh, the english poetry began to exhibit from the end of the 18th century onwards 
In Lyrical Ballads was a collection of a set of poems by Coleridge and um, Wordsworth. Incidentally, only Wordsworth, uh, only Coleridge, uh, one poem is part of this work, which is a naturalist uh, work, The Ancient Mariner. And uh, a number of Wordsworth's poems, such as Goody Blake, The Thorn, The Idiot Boy, are all part of this work, Lyrical Ballads. Lyrical Ballads was more than a collection of poems. It was more like a theory of poetry which was being put forward. And the design of this uh, collaboration uh, was to also to include two kinds of poetry into a single kind of, uh, uh, into a single kind of uh, book. Uh, firstly, this kind of uh, poetry, uh, it focused on the incidents and agents who were um, at least in part supernatural. So, in that sense, there is a an element of uh, medieval interest coming in, there is a revival of the middle ages and also a certain sense of the, uh, the, uh, the magicality of the earlier times coming back into poetry and in literature. And secondly, the subjects were to be chosen from ordinary life and this was also a very significant uh, transition and a new kind of tendency which was getting infused into the literature of the times. Because until then, one had to always rely on the either the great lives of the uh, people who uh, lived earlier or, or, or on something more uh, uh, larger than life, uh, or something as commonplace as ordinary life or real life was never a major subject matter of poetry. So, this work in that sense was quite revolutionary in the sense that it could bring in two kinds of things together. One the supernatural and the magical elements of the past and secondly all the subject matter which could also be part of the ordinary life. As the, uh, the preface uh, written to lyrical ballads, it is in fact one of the foundational texts of literary criticism as well. In that uh, both of them they have also laid out certain principles that they uh, firmly believed in and also they thought it should become part of uh, poetry and literature. And this uh, it is useful to remember that was also an extension of the revolutionary ideals and the radical principles that uh, Wordsworth believed in. They uh, together they went on to write in the preface. The principal object then proposed in these poems were to ch was to choose incidents and situations from common life and to relate or describe them throughout in a selection of the language really used by men and at the same time to throw over them a certain colouring of imagination whereby ordinary things should be presented to the mind in an, in, in an usual aspect. So, here we find a few things being highlighted, the most important one being imagination and also we can identify three major strains of thought emerging from this. First of all, Wordsworth's choice of subject which he believed should be from common life and also from humble rustic life. Secondly, he advocated the treatment of themes in an appropriate language which was closer to real life and the language of uh, language as it is used by common people in real actual life. And thirdly, Wordsworth emphasizes the use of imagination in the poetic transformation of his materials. And this is also against a tendency to reflect any kind of writing in an absolutist or realist form. Here we find that imagination becomes a kind of a catalyst which in, in many ways transform the real material that the poet encounters and that transforms it into something more poetic, more visionary and something more uh, creative and interesting. So, um, based on these three principles, we find Wordsworth continues to write his poems, but how, uh, how close his poetry was to real life, how close his poetic language to the language spoken by the common people that is uh, again a matter of deba debate which we shall come back to at a later point of time. But nevertheless, we find that Wordsworth's work was uh, uh, quite integral to and also part of the general democratic movement of his time. So, in that sense, despite of the ways in which he had, uh, he had denounced, uh, denounced the radical and the revolutionary ideals, we find all of those ideals coming back together with a lot of spirit and fervor into his poetical renderings. His writing trend is gen in general was towards a simplification of life, which also became the more dominant form of uh, uh, expression in the coming decades. And certain other general principles which influenced his uh, kind of writing was his uh, sympathies, his belief in human nature, his uh, uh, assertion of natural manhood, the selection of homely materials for poetic purposes, etc. And overall, we can find that his work was an extension of the radical tendencies of the revolutionary age that the uh, 18th and the 19th century uh, was. The major works of uh, William Wordsworth include the lines written about Tintin Abbey, the Ode on the Intimations of Immortality and the Excursion. 
he is generally considered as the greatest poet of the country and of natural life so much so that william uh, henry hudson remarks about him that he was the keenest eyed of all modern poets for what is deeply essential in nature as we begin to wrap up today's session let's also uh, leave in anticipation of the other poets who are to follow mainly uh, coleridge blake and the other minor poets of the uh, of the romantic period we shall also be undertaking a uh, comparison between the works of wordsworth and also how it influenced the writings of the other major poets of this time so with this we come to the end of today's session thank you for listening i look forward to seeing you in the next session